It sort of makes sense to me that you can't cast a whole array, although at the same time it's kind of unfortunate. So, I mean, is it, um... No, it's not a, uh... So if I say p.select and select many, can I force the result from one thing to another? Projects each element of a sequence into a new form by incorporating the element... You can select the casted version of each. Um, C sharp link cast array. I'm sure there's an easy little example. Given an array, you can use array.convertall as well. That seems like what we might want to do. Uh, hex h's is equal to um, array dot con no array dot convert all except that's not a thing. So take p and convert it uh, via oh, a return a casted version something like hex a there you go it seems to compile well, you're still running. That might be confusing things. Yeah, that that works. It's no, there's got to be. I'm sure there's probably a, a better way to convert the whole array. Uh, but we got a pathfinding path of length six, and if I hit space, he is moving to the right. Okay. That's perfect. Um, there's a little bit of confusion there. The first click didn't go because the first tile in it is the start tile, which we probably want to ignore, but we can sort something out for that. Cast can also be a function from one type to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll see if there's a there's a, just a slicker way of doing it. I mean, this is perfectly fine. It's a one-liner that converts from the uh, path tiles to the other one. Maybe instead of just calling these P, I'll call this path tiles, um, uh, path hexes. There we go. So we want to drop the first one, actually, um, which would be easier if these were maybe as a list or something like that. Generics. Yeah, and that's it. I'm wondering if instead of using interfaces, if it might have been better to do everything as generics implementation, because that's also fine. Um, I guess we could still do both, right? Because you can force a generic um, to be a subclass and or an implementation of an interface. Um, and then you could have find path just really return the hexes directly. That's probably a better situation. That's probably what I'll look at. I don't think we're gonna we're gonna tweak this code here now. But we've got that. Um, so yeah, so that's good. We could do probably do something like here. We can just say something like DQ um, first hex is the one we're standing in. So throw it out. You know, maybe we sometimes do, maybe you don't. Like, it's good that the pathfinding system returns the first hex, uh, but because you might have some implementation as well. So if I hit P, we do the pathfinding. If I hit spacebar, our character is going to move five tiles to the right, and then he's done. He's done sorting. He's done following his path. So obviously, the pathfinding system again right now treats all tiles as having a cost of one. That'll be the next thing to change. That won't actually take very long at all, um, and we might be able to squeeze a little bit of that in there. So right now, the problem is that right now. Um, the only thing that differentiates tile types is this function here, the update hex visuals, which just forces the right model and texture for the terrain. But the hex itself actually has no idea what its tile type is. Literally no clue whatsoever. Um, and 
that's fine. Um, we've got cost estimate. Da -da 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 base movement cost over here, right? We're not paying attention to this. Um, so what we're going to do as a temporary whatever is right over here, public float er int movement cost to do. This is just a temporarily public value. Just, just so that we can test a few things with our with our pathfinding. We'll have it default to a, a value of one, and our little function here that is returning the base movement cost is literally just gonna return this over here. We're gonna make some tweaks to it later on. Um, and then in our hex map, where we, where we are um, spawning our tree graphics and everything like that, um, and all this is definitely gonna have to get changed, but um, we are going to want to set the movement costs to be equal to two over here. Like this is this is this is crap. But this whole function is going to go away later on. Grasslands, grasslands, desert, uh, mountain. What we really want it to be is impassable. So probably a negative value to show that. Um, and that's a whole other thing. Like if if uh, if a tile is impassable. then what does that mean? And we actually don't deal with that right now. So right now I'm just going to set the movement cost of the mountains to like, even that's not going to work because we're actually still going to be able to enter the tiles because we'll just be like, well, we're, if we're adjacent to the mountain, then we can enter it. So we're going to have to figure out how we want to flag impassable tiles because our current code are um, in the project porcupine impassable tiles simply didn't get added to the graph. And that's the one reason that you create the graph for the movement. But again, it's not quite so straightforward because different units follow different rules for the graph. So again, it's not there. It's mostly when we check the aggregate cost to enter over here. Um, that's probably you can do, actually. Let me let me go back here. We'll set the, the mountains to a negative amount. Some negative number because you're not supposed to be able to enter it. Uh, right now, our units can walk on water as well. Uh, so let's say that you can't walk on water either. Okay. And so in our aggregate um, cost function over here, so the base turns to enter hex is going to be if base turns to enter hex is less than zero, then this is impassable terrain. So we're going to return an aggregate cost of something below zero. And in our pathfinding, and I don't like that there's like a little check, like there's a wonky thing like that, but something like if uh, the total pathfinding cost to neighbor is under zero, uh, the values less than zero. I mean, we could throw exceptions, we could do all kinds of things, we could have it actually return a boolean, um, and then have like an out value or a reference value. This is this is probably okay. Uh, represent an invalid slash impassable. Impassable, impassable tile. Um, so what we do is we run continue. So we skip this. We don't. We don't. We assume that this is an invalid move. So ah, got pathfinding length of zero. You know why? Because, and we, we can see from our previous example, moving five tiles to the right, one, two, three, four, five, we're actually trying to end up on a mountain, which is an invalid move in the first place. So let's change it to be um, six tiles to the right in our little dummy function. Six tiles to the right. So what we're going to be doing in this case is we're going to be trying to land on the forest just one tile to the right of the mountain. So if I hit P now... No good. Hmm. So if I just say one, we may not be able to uh, to debug this because uh, we've only got seven minutes left before going to single player. No, we're getting a zero path every time. So somewhere along the way, we've we've made an oops here. Probably. I'm assuming this happens all the time, because it always returns zero.
or under zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're literally we're literally never getting to this line here. Why does it say impassable terrain so many times? It does have the mountain next to us. At. Hex dot. Do we have a two string for the hex? Did we ever implement a, a fancy version of that? No. We should have a two string in here. Public string to string. I guess we need to override. I don't know if that's the right signature. Does it suggest anything? Impassable terrain at 3715. 3715 is clearly not impassable. So base turn center hex is under zero because movement cost enter hex is returning a value below zero. Movement cost enter hex is here, which is base movement cost, which is returning movement cost. Why is it set to... So somewhere over here we're setting like... One of these things is being stupid. Let's comment them both out and confirm that we're not getting impassable terrain all the time. Okay. There you go. So you can move to the right. Excellent. Is it the ocean one? I must be checking things incorrectly. Okay, it's the ocean code that's screwing things up. This is running for too many things or something, I don't know. If I let the mountains... It's... something's not checking right. Pathfind... Okay. So the mountain code's not interfering. In theory. If we were trying to pathfind to... Minus one, plus one. to minus one, uh, plus one. So this is, we're trying to step onto the mountain that's next to us. This should tell us no. That is correct. Well, actually it sort of hangs for a long time and then returns. Weirdness. P. Yeah, it actually processes for way too long before failing out and not being able to get there. 
Okay, I mean, at least that's correct. I think it's not checking the right tiles for something. Um, one thing I should do... Uh, what am I looking to change here? Hex map. Somewhere along the way, it's not checking the right thing. Uh, but on our little hex label... Where is it? Prefabs. Hex prefab. If I wanted to add a second line to this, would that be okay? Yes, it would. Good. Um, so what I want... Where do we actually set the text? Somewhere in here, right? get the third property in there. Oh, it doesn't have the um, the cost in at this point yet. Hold on. We got to do it after we update the the visuals here. Cuz the visuals is where we're updating the movement cost, which is so inaccurate, but shush, it's fine. Um Because first we create a world where everything is ocean, and then we go and make it not be ocean. So I think what we have to do here is something like this. Maybe. There we go! Okay! Yeah. Because, yeah, the first the world is created, it's all just water. Excellent. Excellent. Um, just to make it a little easier to see, and we're going to be, again... This is going to be changed at some point to not be so silly. We'll just put a couple of 99s in there because it's a little hard to see. So now, if I hit P, and now I hit space, he'll move over here. And that's it, because it's a path of one. But most importantly, if I go to our unit and tell him once again to move six tiles to the right, will he find a path around the water and around the mountains or not. Might still be broken. It's entirely possible. Hit P. We've got a path of length 9. That's very interesting. So let's watch his movement because he's trying to get to the forest right over here. Okay? He can't walk through the water here. He can't walk through this mountain. He can't walk through this mountain. There's also different terrain. We'll have to... Ideally we want to draw a preview of the path. So he walks to the right. Then he walks down, then he walks one step to the right, then he walks there. I never read any of the, uh, the tips, I'm sorry, I've been very too focused. Look at him go around the mountains! Dodging hills, dodging mountains. Yes, there might still be some errors, it's entirely possible. But that's what we'll start to see once we can actually see the path. Woo! Alright, so first of all, i got to apologize to Terja, who did remind me that the tips weren't working earlier, and I never actually read your message. So, sorry. Uh, 2300 hours. Discovered that Quest for Glory 1 to 5 is available on Steam. What? <laughs> 0800 hours. Wonder what happened to the night. Quest for Glory is awesome. Now, I knew the game originally as Hero Quest, or Hero's Quest, uh, but they had to change the name to Quest for Glory because it turns out there was a board game called Hero Quest that was very similar. Fantastic Sierra games. I only ever played the first one um, to completion, and I dabbled at the second one, but that's about it. Great games, though. Uh, and friend zone forever. Thank you very much for that. T 
Kip, this is essentially a quillion dollars, right? Absolutely. Oh man, and what a time for that to come in, just as we achieve success with our pathfinding system. So again, we didn't rewrite the A-star stuff, but we tried to genericize things a little bit more. I suspect we're probably right in that we'll have to use, we, we may want to use actual generics um, at some point just to uh, get the return value to be exactly what we're looking for. Um, with a little bit less manipulation, but that should be perfectly fine and okay. And something else, something for us to look into um, next time. It's actually very little code that we'd have to change to probably slicken that up considerably. But yeah, we have actual pathfinding. So the next thing to do will be to interface this with the mouse controls, which won't be too hard at all. Um, the idea being that you can click on a unit to select the unit um, and then uh, probably hold down the right mouse button to start a movement mode. And as you move the mouse around, it'll draw, it'll do, it'll constantly be doing pathfindings uh, and it'll draw a line or highlight tiles or some sort of damn visual, I don't know, um, from the unit to whatever tile your mouse is over while you're holding the right mouse button. When you release the right mouse button, then is when it will go and uh, take that, that calculated path and actually set it as the hex path for the unit over here. But for now, again, I'm gonna hit P, P runs the pathfinding, and now if I can hit space, he's gonna go there, he can't go through that stuff, he's gonna go south, up onto the hill, then he's gonna dodge the other hill because it's faster to go around it, possibly a little. I'm actually willing to bet it's all probably, it's not, it's exactly the same amount of distance. Now that's interesting. It's exactly the same number of turns here. Um, if you think about it, right? It's exactly the same number of turns. Because it's going to take... So he's just moved on to here. So he's on a fresh turn of movement. So moving to here eats all his movement. And then, so from here to there, it can go one, two turns. Or one turn, two turns. It's the same amount, but I think we want to prioritize straight lines. And go here. And go there. And the great thing as well is if I were to hit, oh, well, it's not going to work. If I hit P again, he's once again going to try to pathfind uh, six tiles to his right, which actually isn't going to be valid. Yeah, we get it. We get an error because he's trying to pathfind to a tile over here in the ocean, and that's no good. Speaking of, where's where's the dude? I can't actually see him. Oh, there he is. Hello. My little dwarf. You're stuck in a tree. That's fine. Straight lines are overrated. Hills have defense bonus. Yeah. So there's um there's a couple of things we could do to tweak the... Um, it, hills have defense bonus. Hills also have vision bonuses. So we actually want to prefer... If it's all the same, we want to prefer going up a hill. Um, and so that's like... That's a kind of interesting how we might want to tweak that in there. Um, that's very interesting. What we could do is right here is if we compare if this new movement is better or not, right? Because this code is, this code, if you read it, is, um, is the neighbor already in the open set? If so, and if this new score is worse than the old score, worse, discard this new result, right? So that's all we're doing is we're saying if this new score is greater than or equal to the old score, then forget about it. But we could offload this to another function delegate that is responsible for this comparison. And that function delegate could say, hey, if the two scores are exactly the same, if the two scores are exactly the same, i.e. the amount of movement it takes to get onto this hill would be the same as sort of going around in a slightly different way, we're going to check a different comparison and say, like, so if these two results are exactly the same, but this one results in us ending up on top of a hill or spending more time on hills or, having a path that looks more straight and less zigzaggy 
then we're going to prefer this new one. Even though the two numbers are exactly the same, we're going to prefer the one that is tactically uh, more sound in some fashion because it spends more time on hills slash forests. That would be okay. Or we could we could just like fuzz it with a little bit of extra number. Like every time you are on a flat tile, because that's what Sponk is saying. Let's say every time you're on a flat tile, add 0 0.001 to the movement cost, such that flat tiles count as slightly more expensive a move. Just barely, not enough to like uh, make it you take a longer path to avoid flat tiles, but meaning that if all things are equal, flat tiles look a little bit worse, look a little bit more expensive. And that might be all it takes to fuzz it. But that's something we could experiment with down the road. Armored tree should be a special defense unit. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that we've seen before. That's actually, uh, adding that like little 0001 type thing is a good way to prevent excessive zigzagging in a world where you've got square hexes and where diagonal movement just costs one, right? If it just costs one to move diagonally, which is very common in square tile based games, then what you do is you tend to, um, in the pathfinding system, make it so that diagonal movement costs slightly more than one. Not not the real diagonal cost, which is what, like 1.4 or whatever, if you're doing true, like, Euclidean or distances. Um, but you add, like, just that tiny 0 0.001 to a diagonal move so that um, the pathfinding will try to avoid diagonals. Because otherwise, um, in the system where all movement is equal to one, um, a move that goes this way is exactly the same as a move that goes that way, except the second one looks idiotic. So you don't want that to happen, um, even though functionally they're exactly the same. But that will bring us to the end of today's segment. Probably the next episode, I will probably just go ahead, and, maybe I'll even do it in between episodes, is, is convert the pathfinding to use generics, just because I don't want to have to do this, because this is dumb. Also, it probably means that we can end up with um, slightly better code in... Oh, for the distance over here. So that's this cost estimate. I don't know. It, it actually kind of is reasonable for cost estimate to be different from distance. It happens to use the same here, but that might not always be the case. Our cost estimate, we um, actually... Hmm. We might want to assume mixed terrain, right? So instead of returning the distance as is, which assumes everything is flat, we might want to like add in a little bit of padding. Assume that the path ahead is worse than it is. Um, one of the interesting things you can do is you can mess with the um, this cost estimate, this heuristic function in A star by adding more numbers or, or reducing the numbers. You can make the bigger this value is. The bigger the value is, I think it can speed up the algorithm, but has a chance of being inaccurate. Whereas if you make this value less, it can slow down the algorithm, but make it uh, more likely to return the truest, shortest path. In that if your cost estimate returns zero, if you just return zero as your cost estimate, then all of a sudden you're implementing Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, instead of A star, but it's guaranteed to be 100% the fastest method. There's 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 something like that. I mean, I guess the cost estimate always returns the same amount regardless of the hexes. That's how you get Dijkstra's. Um, you want Dijkstra's because this is how you get Dijkstra's. Uh, so there, there's there's some room for fuzzy. So it might make sense for cost estimate to be a different function than distance. I mean, distance clearly is return the cubic distance between two hexes, uh, whereas cost estimate is the thing for pathfinding and therefore might conceivably, it's conceptually a different thing. Therefore, it might be okay that it's implemented this way. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, we're going to wrap up the programming here. We're going to be loading up the Rim World. I'm just going to take a short two-minute break so I can bio. When we come back, we're going to be playing Rim World with zombies. Uh, thank you, everyone, by the way, who supports the uh, the, the Quilly Teen Creates channel over on patreon.com slash Quilly Teen Creates. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to you, we get to take over the program, the uh, the live stream. Uh, it is worth noting that the next Let Em Dare is at the end of July. Uh, it's coming a little faster than normal. Um, there might be a scheduling conflict for there for me. Uh, it might mean we don't get to do a whole weekend of Let Em Dare. Stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, we'll try to do what we can, but we're going to have to play that one by ear. In any case, two-minute break. We come back with RimWorld. Uh, be back in a couple. 
Hey, uh, I want to say a great big thank you to all the June Patreon supporters and these mic check supporters. We've got Yuko Finn, Eric Sumner, Tiburon, Mighty Mix, Pavel Zdanov, Drazion, Michael McClintock, Aaron Toyson, Craig Mortel, the not so evil engineer, Julien Auger Lafont, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Valen Cakeveen, Thomas Oberson, Jason Yanity, Stephen Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, and Neil Blakey Milner, and absolutely everyone who watches, shares, favorites, and subscribes to these videos. Thank you so, so much.